Okay, looks like we've got quite a few folks that have entered in. April, you ready to kick this off? Okay, great. Uh, welcome everyone, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Tim Gillette, I'm the Deputy of Operations for the Child Welfare Programs at Oregon Department of Human Services. And we're so happy that you're all here with us today. Happy New Year. It's been an interesting New Year so far. A couple of rough days here with the winter storm. I know most of us live in, in the valley here and it's it, for us, this is definitely extreme weather. So um, we really appreciate you joining us despite that. Um, you know, people are still trickling in, in a little bit, but while they're coming in, let's go through some logistics. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Um, and if you want captioning, I believe that's available. If you click on the CC button located at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then a couple of housekeeping details. If you'd like us to get your questions, please use the Q&A function. Uh, you should see the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen as well. And as we have time, we'll um, answer as many questions as we can at the end. Uh, we do have quite a few things to go over today, so we'll see how much time we have left. And then we'll make sure that we follow up on any questions that we're not able to get to. Um, again, thanks for uh, being a part of this community connection chat today. Um, our last chat was in September, and uh, it's it's exciting to, to know that we're kicking off a new year. Um, and I'd like to start by having my colleagues on the leadership team introduce themselves. April, you want to go first? If I can remember how to mute myself, good afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year. I hope you are all safe and warm out there uh, in this weather. My name is April flint Gurner. she, her pronouns, Child Welfare Director. Thanks, Tim. Lacey, you want to go next? Sure. Good afternoon, you all. I'm Lacey Andreessen. She her pronouns. I'm the Deputy Director for the Child Welfare Division. Welcome and thanks for joining us. And Lisa? Hopefully you all can hear me. I am without internet. Um, it's telling me I'm unstable, so uh, I'm not going to take personal offense to that. Lisa Bender, she, her pronouns, assistant deputy director. Um, I may be off and on camera though, as my connection is not great. Uh, just one of those things that we're dealing with today and you I came through be here. pretty good there. It, it was a little warbly at times, but I think we got you. So thank you. And then uh, Alicia. Thanks, Tim. Good afternoon, Alicia Cox. She, her pronouns, assistant deputy of strategy innovation. Good to see you all. We have quite a few attendees despite the weather. So good to see you. Thank you, Alicia. Perfect. Okay. Um, all right, let's get this started. April, I'm going to kick it over to you to get us started. Um, and then we'll go from there. Thank you, Tim. Um, so again, I'm April Flint Garner. I want to say thank you. Thank you to all of you who have taken your time this week, um, especially with all the things going on, um, with the storm we've had and just coming out of the holidays and those kinds of things and really hard conversations that are happening about um, all kinds of things in our state. And really before we talk about the new year, um, I wanna acknowledge the hard work that all of you do, both our, our community partners, our resource families out there, um, advocates, um, you know, any and everybody uh, who we work with, uh, our staff that are here, um, we just appreciate you. Um, we know that we don't see all the time, you know, all the things that you do every day, but we greatly value you um, and are here to be servant leaders alongside you. We know our kids, families, and communities are facing a lot of challenges right now. And in the face of these challenges, I really continue to be completely inspired by your dedication and passion for serving Oregonians. And whether you are you know, a nonprofit leader, a resource family, or an advocate, I'm honored to have you as a partner in this work. And I'll just reiterate, reiterate what I said earlier. Um, in 2024, I'm gonna continue to do my best to show up with transparency and accountability in the spirit of improving our child serving systems and supporting all of you in the work that you do. Uh, these community connections are really a time for us to hear from you about what's on your mind and to keep the lines of communication open. Um, and so continue to submit your good questions in the Q&A and we'll get to as many as we can today. 
I also want to note that there are a lot of staff here. And um, so while they're absolutely open and staff are welcome to be here. Um, we want to make sure that um, the, the voices of our community partners um, are really highlighted and centered in these because we do have all staff chats. Um, but welcome. Glad to see you all here. Don't feel bad about being here, um, but just want to make sure that our community feels welcome as well. So with that, I'd like to highlight a few updates from 2023 and speak about a little about work that's coming up in 2024. Um, so I want to start with the legislative front. You may know that several bills passed that have implications for child, children and families. Um, so our Senate Bill 209, which is our Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity Expression, or SOGI Protections Bill, took effect on January 1. It allows us to keep uh, SOGI information um, for children in our custody confidential and not subject to um, discovery obligations within the juvenile dependency. Um, or termination of parental rights proceedings. Um, this information was previously discoverable um, and it's an important part of protecting youth privacy rights around sensitive issues of identity. This legislation is gonna impact how we handle child statements about their SOGI information um, and what we share with courts. And it likely does not change your role or requirements regarding, regarding to protecting the privacy of children's personal information. It really is more about our us and what we are protecting. Uh, also, Senate Bill 865 makes multiple changes in the substitute care Oregon revised statute, including requirements for us at DHS to provide written notification to any parents about the existing current caretaker statute when a child comes into care. It also requires the department to reconsider any relative or current caretaker taken to adoption selection, but not selected as an adoptive resource if that adoption is, is, is disrupted. Largely, this bill codified our existing practice into statute. We also continued to build out our collaboration with self-sufficiency programs last year. Uh, we're working together wherever possible to improve the ways that we serve families and ultimately, we wanna help families get what they need um, so that they don't have to come into foster care. We are particularly focused on shifting to a model where we partner to support families and children's safety before child welfare gets involved. This collaborative approach is, is about making sure families experiencing poverty and the impacts of poverty have, again, the supports and services that they need and that they're not being further marginalized. So one example of this work in the last year uh, was a new pilot project in District 2, which is Multnomah County. Child welfare and self-sufficiency added family coach positions to reach out to tribal families after hotline calls uh, were closed at screening. Um, these family coaches work side by side with our child welfare staff, um, and they work um, side by side with families to provide resources, referrals um, for supports, and really in tailored ways that help, um, you know, that just help families thrive. So ultimately, the goal is to move away from over surveillance of the child welfare system um, that's really resulted in the overrepresentation of black and brown children in foster care and support families earlier. And I'm really excited to share that this work is getting recognized at the national level um, and we're connecting with others who are focusing on prevention across the country. Um, one example of this is that uh, Claire Seguin and I, Claire Seguin is the, is the director for self-sufficiency programs. We keep getting excited, invited to places to present on our prevention efforts across the nation are really being heralded nationally um, in terms of our vision for transformation around an anti-poverty approach to the uh, reduction of foster care. I'm also really proud of our partnership with the Nine Tribes of Oregon and Tribal Affairs our priority this last year and this year continuing will be to strengthen our implementation of the Oregon Indian Child Welfare Act and Indian Child Welfare Act and to serve tribal families through culturally responsive services that honor tribal sovereignty. So a couple of key highlights from this year include our foster care program collaborated with the tribes to increase access accessibility of our respite program. Um, the legislature allocated general funds to support training for respite care providers, travel costs, tangible supports, beds, food, safety items, those kinds of things. And what the respite program is about is giving a break um, to caregivers um, who, need, who need a break sometimes. We all need a break. Um, as a mom um, with a 23-year-old, he's a good kid, but, you know, sometimes you need a break. And, and it's really important that we have 
um, programming in place um, to help provide um, needed rest um, for the people who take such good care of kids in our state. I wanna thank all of you today for your partnership and being here. Again, I know this work is challenging and at the same time, it is incredibly important. And sometimes we forget to thank one another. So I wanna express my gratitude to you for your advocacy, your time, your honesty, your dedication um, to children and families in the state. I'm gonna hand it back over to Tim for the next part of our webinar. Thank you, April. Uh, appreciate the updates. And actually, Lacey's going to go next to talk a little bit about temporary lodging and some of the program highlights from the last year. Thanks, Tim. Uh, it's really good to be with you all today. I wanted to start with a topic that's been um, both in front of the legislature and in the media recently around temporary lodging and the settlement agreement. And I'd also like to give you all a brief update on where we are to work with Dr. Marty Beyer. Um, but to start, let me give some background for those of you who may not be as familiar. Uh, in 2016, a federal class action lawsuit was filed against the Department of Human Services Child Welfare on behalf of foster children who had experienced temporary lodging. We know that the use of temporary lodging in Oregon, and that is defined as a child that was staying either in a child welfare office or in a hotel with staff, started as early as 2012. And by 2016, the number of children who were experiencing that had increased. And so the lawsuit was filed on behalf of them um, to end the use of temporary lodging as a, a, a placeholder placement for children experiencing foster care. In 2018, the state as defendants and the plaintiffs, of the parties who filed the suit, were through a settlement agreement. Um, and in that settlement agreement, it had very, it has, uh, very specific reporting requirements. It also included um, imposed numeric limits that decreased over time at a very rapid rate uh, to eliminate the use of temporary lodging. And those numeric caps include numbers. They also include the age of children, the number of times they can be in temporary lodging an episode. It's called the number of days. So there's multiple different factors that are being measured and reported on under that settlement agreement. Because um, a variety of struggles have happened, we've gone back into arbitration um, twice with the plaintiffs in that case because we've not been in compliance with the numeric caps. Most recently, um, that was in the summer of 2022. Um, but in the, in the first arbitration order, the judge ordered that we create the resource management director. That's the sole ODHS employee who could approve a child for temporary lodging. That person also approves all of our dollars that are expended to prevent uh, TL or to support children who are in TL. It also required that the agency spend up to a certain dollar amount per child per night uh, to avoid temporary lodging if at all possible. And then the other role of the RMD, the resource management director, is to assure that the casework team has done everything necessary and available um, to avoid temporary lodging. And then if necessary, she does approve temporary lodging. So through 2020 into 2022, we utilized those and other avenues to attempt to eliminate TL. When we were not successful in doing that, we went back into arbitration again. And then in June of this year, we got uh, the judge's order that appointed Dr. Marty Beyer as a legal term that's called a special master, someone who comes in and works alongside the jurisdiction to see what all is happening with temporary lodging, what are the dynamics, and then report back to the judge, is there anything else that the child welfare agency could be doing to reduce or eliminate the utilization of temporary lodging and get us into compliance with that settlement agreement. It was, uh, it's been a long and, and really uh, prosperous effort from my perspective and our partnership with Dr. Beyer. Uh, she spent time with our team. Um, she spent time in temporary lodging staffing. She's talked with many, many community partners of all types, including likely many of you, and has submitted her report to the judge. Uh, that report is in very much draft form because the judge makes the final order about rec what recommendations um, he does or does not impose based on the work of Dr. Beyer. And, you know, we're, we're kind of in a wait and see mode around um, what, what his decision will be on that. There was a hearing last week that Dr. Beyer participated in and the draft, um, her draft report was submitted in that hearing as, as a um, 
piece of evidence. So we can have some, uh, when I'm finished, I can drop the link in the chat if you'd like to see um, that hearing and also that draft report. We are continuing to be committed to doing everything in our power to reduce and eliminate temporary lodging. And we know, I would be remiss to not say, it is not the best setting for children. It is certainly not the best experience for our staff and it's not best for children and the, their families who are serving. And we can't do it alone. There's gaps that child welfare and ODHS cannot be um, responsible for alone. And that's really being recognized more and more as partners and providers recognize that the challenges of the system for the children that we're serving. I'm hoping um, April was able to participate in and present at the System of Care Advisory Council in December. I'm hoping she could give us a quick, quick update on what that was like for her and what she heard there. Yes, Lacey, thank you. I did present to the uh, Children's System of Care uh, Advisory Council <clears throat> That group acts as a central, <clears throat> excuse me, impartial forum for statewide policy development, funding strategy recommendations and planning. And the council's real goal is to improve the effectiveness and efficacy of child serving state agencies and the continuum of care that provides services to youth. So in that presentation, I walked through the current state for folks um, from various agencies, including Oregon Health Authority, judges, advocates, um, people with lived experience and expertise, providers. What really struck me was this collective sense that this is a crisis that we need to solve together. Um, we really think, and you know, collectively, it's time to end kind of the finger pointing and, and get to the work of solving the problem. And clearly, child welfare cannot solve it alone. So we're not, you know, trying to uh, abdicate our responsibility in the conversation. What we're saying is that we need help and that all of the best solutions that we can come up with um, are best made when we do it together. So I think there is real empathy across the board um, for families who have been struggling with um, complex needs of children that they are caring for, um, for our caregivers and resource parents who have been dealing with this, providers, our staff, um, and the young people who are experiencing it. It is just not okay, right? Um, and I know that there is a real desire to collaborate to solve this. And Lacey and I have been saying, we actually see light at the end of the tunnel. We feel like we're finally having the right conversation. So I'm really encouraged to see what 2024 is going to bring us. Back to you, Lacey. Thanks, April. A couple other uh, highlights from some of the work we're doing in prevention and family preservation, um, as well as our focuses for 2024. We continue to really focus and implement our family preservation approach as we learn more about what works with families through our demonstration sites. And I wanna to continue to practice really honing our language around that. When we say family preservation, we're talking about families known to both the child welfare and the self-sufficiency agency who we are serving together to keep their children in home with parents while we're managing safety. In 2023, we have increased and expanded from three to eight counties. So we had started with Alberta, Douglas, and Klamath County, and we've expanded to Gresham. I should say Alberta is a branch in Multnomah County. Multnomah County is large, it has several. Gresham is an additional branch in Multnomah County. And then we've added uh, Polk County, Coos and Curry counties, Josephina, Jackson, and Washington counties. It's been exciting to watch the innovation and new programs as they blossom out of that work. One highlight has been the use of family coaches uh, and their role. Family coaches are actually a position in our self-sufficiency sister organization. And we're really partnering together around what's their right sized role in expansive case management and intensive case management, both prior to a family coming to the attention of child welfare and then during a CPS assessment, we're learning some things. We're gonna keep uh, looking at how we advocate together uh, to the legislative body and to the governor about um, seeing where we can see really opportunity and outcomes that lead to primary prevention of child abuse that will always live outside of the child welfare system, but our partnership with self-sufficiency and that is really important. And it's, it's exciting to see what we're learning there. Related to um, you know, serving families together, we have important updates about Family First. Family First Prevention Services Act was uh, sponsored by our own Senator Wyden and passed in 2018. We've talked with you all 
about it uh, quite a bit before, but it is the utilization of federal dollars to prevent children needing to enter foster care. Again, those being the children and families we're serving together with self-sufficiency by using, utilizing family preservation. And we have um, working on an expansion to that plan. We've also finalized a contract for evaluation and reporting. We're having an outside entity come in to evaluate and then report with us on how we're doing with implementation and where we see impact. And then secondly, this year, we're excited to be working into um, our first amendment to our federally approved plan. It's going to potentially expand who, what families can be served with those dollars. Um, and most importantly, how we wanna center the people with lived experience, those most impacted in decision-making about what that plan is gonna look like. In addition um, to both, to just the service provision to families and home, we're also looking to expand our Kinship Navigator program. And that program is uh, managed right, right now by Greater Oregon Behavioral Health, Inc., also known as GOBI. And it serves relative caregivers taking care of their own relative children who have nothing to do with child welfare at all. So again, another strategy for true primary prevention, um, supporting families, supporting their own family without needing to have the um, help or the assistance of the state. Efforts like those and many others uh, continue to support our reduction, our safe reduction of children in care between January and 2000, between January of 2013 and January of 23, the number of dropped um, of children in foster care by 39%. So we were at 4,800 and change. By September of last year, it had dropped even further to 4,600 and some change. It's not just about a reduction in numbers because we know that children and families often need support to prevent child welfare involvement, like I was talking about with that primary prevention strategy, as well as supports after reunification to make sure their family is well and cool and moves forward better after they have had interventions for us. Uh, we on uh, one other question that's been submitted that I wanted to talk about a little bit today is what we're doing to recruit, train, and keep our important workforce that is resource families. One, I think, unintended impact of the stress and attention of temporary lodging is that it sometimes feels like we have a capacity issue where really it's a, it's a capacity issue for a very, very small number of children that is a system capacity. And many children, and most children even, in the foster care system in the state are getting the right kind of care from the right kind of resource families and doing very well. However, it is important that those families are trained and supported um, so they stay with us and so they can continue to serve other children who may need them. We focused on... Um, implementing our respite program and have, have started in January of last year. We now have launched and are fully launched into this year. We have over 200 individuals who are certified. We're going to continue to build that out and make that available for um, parents who have their children in home as well. Some of the other supports that resource families get and will continue to focus on is their training. The initial training is called draft uh, has been completely redone and it is available and we're getting really positive feedback from that. We continue to expand our partnership and support for what's available through KEEP, which is a group um, model for learning and support for resource families. And we're gonna continue start looking in, and really understanding and looking at what can we do beyond the initial training to get interim support and training to families to get them the supports they need for exactly the needs of the children that they're serving at this time. We're excited to see you know, what might come this year. And as always, if you are a resource parent who is on this um, time with us, reach out and let us know how we can help. You also should be expecting to hear soon from our foster care program. April and I would like to do some listening sessions uh, specifically with resource parents so we can understand exactly how you're experiencing our system and what else we can do this for you. And with that, Sam, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you for all those updates, Lacey. Appreciate that. Um, today, we have a couple uh, special guests with us. We're honored to have Mary Geelan and Kristen Tomnahawk with us to talk about prevention, screening, and safety updates uh, that are going to happen in 2024 and the importance of serving a broader range of families and improving our hotline. Kristen Tomnahawk is the Child Welfare Screening Program Manager and, and ORCA Manager 
and Mary is the family first integrated policy manager. Welcome to both of you. And I believe Kristen, you're gonna go first. I am. Hello, everyone. Kristen Kamnahawk, she, her pronouns, and I'm the screening program and practice manager for the Child Welfare Division. I also provide administrative oversight of the Oregon Child Abuse Hotline, also known as ORCA. And I'm grateful to be with you all today to provide a preview of what the screening program of Child Welfare and the Oregon Child Abuse Hotline's area of focus will be for the next year. In, 20, in 2023, Child Welfare began informational sessions, focus groups, and formal settings to solicit feedback regarding Oregon Revised Statute, Child Welfare Rule, and Procedure from individuals with lived experience, the nine tribes of Oregon, community collabor collaborators, and child safety partners. This included research and evaluation of national best practice. This will continue in 2024, specifically in the areas of one, evaluating the Oregon Department of Human Services Child Abuse Investigation Jurisdiction that includes who can be investigated and when and where child abuse must occur for ODHS to investigate. We'll also be determining a systematic response involving reports of children as alleged perpetrators of child abuse and when child behaviors are harmful to other children. We will also be looking at the design, updates, and evaluation of structured decision-making, SDM tools, and when a report is received at the Oregon Child Abuse Hotline that does not constitute a report of abuse. And the screener determines that the information describes behavior, conditions, or circumstances that pose a risk to a child and is closed at screening. Currently, these reports do not result in action by child welfare. We are in the early stages of examining opportunities for collaboration within communities for upstream secondary and tertiary prevention based services for families. Since 2020, Oregon Child Welfare has been partnering with Evident Change, formerly the National Council on Crime and Delinquency and the Children's Research Center on a nonprofit that uses data and research to improve our social systems. Their structured decision-making model is a decision support system informed by research, policy, and best practices. This approach uses clearly defined and consistently applied decision-making criteria for child protection systems. The SDM system is a suite of six tools that fit together to cover the key decision points or questions in the life of a child welfare case. The SDM model supports decision-making. They do not make decisions. Individuals within child protection systems utilize these tools and their professional discretion from training, coaching, and experience in making the decisions that they make. The SDM tool, the first SDM tool is a community reporter guide, which examines for mandatory reporters whether a concern or incident should be reported to the child abuse hotline, or whether the family is in need of resources or services in their own communities. This tool is focused on educating mandatory reporters on definitions of child abuse in Oregon and to facilitate upstream prevention opportunities for children and families in their own communities. This tool will be co-designed with Oregon's mandatory reporters and a project plan will be determined in the spring or summer of 2024. This will likely take 12 to 24 months to implement in alignment with the development of an online reporting portal for mandatory reporters. More to come on that opportunity. The second SDM tool, which is the first decision um, made by the child protection system, contemplates whether a report constitutes an allegation of abuse that must be assigned for child protective services response. And if so, how quickly the department should respond. The screening and response time tool implemented in Oregon Child Welfare in 2022 consists of a screening section and a response time section and provide structure in how to think about these decisions. The abuse types outlined in the screening tool are what Oregon has identified as abuse types that require a CPS response. Every definition and detail within the SDM tool was discussed and chosen by ORCA staff and leadership, child welfare leadership and partners and community members. In total, the development of the tool that Oregon implemented in August of 2022 included 14 groups of community partners and collaborators including nine tribes of Oregon and persons with lived experience. This tool has been evaluated since implementation and updates are underway in partnership with those community partners 
and will be uh, starting in a series of work groups in the next month or two. As Lacey mentioned, um, Oregon is in the process of examining um, what prevention looks like from a child welfare system. What we know is a call to the child abuse hotline is a system intervention. ORCA has a role in upstream prevention by educating and training mandatory reporters and our community partners and community-based organizations, those that are public and private officials as defined in statute on what is defined as child abuse in Oregon and what requires a report to the hotline. But most specifically, how community can respond to family-specific needs for resources and services when a report is not required. This will proactively promote wellness for all families, respond to family-specific needs, and mitigate risk factors for child abuse. As we examine this role at ORCA, we are contemplating the Federal Child Abuse Prevention Act, CAPTA, which requires states to have triage procedures for appropriate referral of a child not at risk of imminent harm to a community organization or voluntary prevention services. This will allow us to expand on strategies and activities offered to populations with risk factors associated with well being or child maltreatment to build protective factors and mitigate risk factors in secondary prevention after a call is made to the hotline. We will also consider strategies and activities in this next year that are focused on where maltreatment has occurred to address the impacts of abuse, healing and working to working as a part of the titiary prevention and family preservation. Oregon revised statute 419B.035 permits the department in referring parents and caregivers to services and resources when information reported to ORCA has closed its screening and identifies needs or risks that could be ameliorated with community support, such as referrals that would require sharing identifying information with community resources. We are currently examining that statute and looking at opportunities in the future uh, for a referral system um, to be established as a part of ORCA's infrastructure and will be a part of our goals for the next uh, year or two. We are excited to engage our communities, tribes of Oregon, and persons with lived experience in evaluation, co-design, and delivery of a systematic approach that will promote equitable service delivery for families most in need and those conditions that place them at high risk or of a re-report to the hotline or future maltreatment. I'm going to hand it over to Mary Gielen to introduce herself. Hi, like Tim said, my name is Mary Geelan. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Family First and Integrated Policy Manager. Um, I work both with child welfare and self-sufficiency. Um, like, Kristen like Kristen shared, not all families that are facing stressors need child welfare intervention. Um, as we clarify the role of the child welfare should play, we want to expand the capacity also in communities to support families um, instead. So luckily for us, the federal government has come to the same conclusion um, about the need to expand prevention um, in our communities. So like Lacey mentioned earlier, the Family First Prevention Services Act allows us to now use our federal Title IV-E dollars to support evidence-based prevention services focused on mental health, substance use disorder, and parenting. Um, Oregon's Title IV-E Prevention Services Plan includes the expansion of four evidence-based practices that you see listed here, the first two of which, Parents as Teachers and Functional Family Therapy, are just launching this year. Um, in 2024, we'll also be working, like Lacey said, with people with lived experience in our systems, tribes, community-based organizations, and our sister agencies to amend Oregon's prevention plan to potentially include additional evidence-based services, as well as importantly, community pathways into prevention services. Right now, the only pathways into services involve involvement with the child welfare system, and we'd like to expand that to have more community pathways into those services. One caveat of Family First is that we can only use federal funds to support prevention services that are deemed evidence-based by the federal Title IV-E Clearinghouse. And we recognized pretty early on in Oregon that we're going to need to expand our investments beyond that and specifically also invest in culturally specific programs 
that are built by and for communities that we serve. So we're doing that with state investments. Um, historically, we've approached these kinds of conversations with communities from the perspective of this is what we as an agency need from you to support families. And now we're really trying to flip that on its head and think and listen first to what communities are telling us they need in order to stabilize families and prevent child welfare involvement. Um, we're doing that in alignment with our Equity North Star by inclusively leading with race and intersectionality in order to address the, root, um, the roots of systemic oppression. Um, we're also thinking more about cross-program partnerships. For instance, as was mentioned earlier, we're looking at closely, we're working closely with self-sufficiency to make services available to families earlier through shared contracts and also piloting of connecting families that are closed at screening with family coaches or community-based organizations to get their needs met and prevent their involvement in child welfare. We're also partnering with our sister agencies like the Oregon Health Authority, the Department of Early Learning and Care, and others to develop a prevention service array for children and families that provides families what they need, when they need it, and who they need it from. At the end of the day, the plan for what needs to exist in communities to keep children safe and families together with equity at the center must be owned not by child welfare, but by the community. And as you might suspect, this takes time. So you may not see these changes overnight, but we look forward to partnering with all of you on bringing this into reality for the families in Oregon. And we're beginning to align our funding and staff time to really support this effort. So thanks for letting us share the work we have underway. With that, I'll hand it back. Thank you, Mary and Kristen, for joining us today and for those wonderful updates. We appreciate that. And uh, next up, we're going to talk about CQI a little bit and uh, what we're looking forward to in 2024. Alicia. Thank you, Tim. Good afternoon, Alicia Cox. She, her pronouns, Assistant Deputy of strategy and innovation. You might hear my kids giggling, laughing, or screaming in the background. We had a snow day again in the Portland area, so bear with me. Uh, in 2003, the Continuous Quality Improvement Program continues to expand its statewide implementation. We expanded to 14 sites in 2023, which is pretty impressive with the small team that we had earlier last year. And now that we're fully staffed and fully geared up with a clear process and feedback loops for implementation, they're gonna to continue to go around the state. The focus on our federal performance measures and case practice improvement measures allows the community, tribes, persons with lived experience, partner organizations to work collaborative, collaboratively together on tangible improvements and efforts and provide transparency in our improvement work. This open door approach to our data and improvements have been well received and we're always inviting others to join us in our meetings for the Continuous Quality Improvement Advisory Committee which is a link that I can pop in the chat, but it was answered previously for community engagement. Or if you're in the district and they're inviting partners, persons with lived experience, tribes, et cetera, to be part of that conversation on the action plans, you may see that invitation coming directly from the district themselves. Sites are seeing double digit improvement efforts on items like face-to-face -face contacts, which we know will lead to quicker times for permanency. So with this continued quality improvement process well underway in multiple districts, it's exciting to see these improvements in the lead measures in our everyday case practice work that will impact those long-term outcome federal performance measures. A really great example is D6 in Douglas County. We, they started their second year of their CQI program and was invigorating to see their lead measures, which was parent face-to-face -face contacts. They saw that in 2019, their contacts were at 36%. And then in 2020, when they underwent CQI, it was up at 50%. And then in 2023, they were at 80%. So with little concentrated measures in, in um, intentional transparency about the work that they're doing in the support of the community, sort of support of workforce, and the guidance of some under the continuous quality improvement methodology, we're able to see long-term sustainable growth and improvement in the area that they're focused on. And in 2024, I mentioned earlier, we're gonna be implementing in all districts across the state. So I'm really excited about their continued growth in the CQI team and practice. A few things in 2024, the Office of Reporting, Research, Analytics and Implementation, or OLRAY, is working with Child Welfare to transfer ROM, which is our re results-oriented management 
it's a house between the University of Kansas right now. So we have all our public reports housed with a cloud over in the University of Kansas land. We are bringing it in-house so that we have some more agility around the types of reports that are available so that we can be more uh, reactive, more attuned to the needs and the data that you all need and also with workforce. So we have a little bit of flexibility and we can be a little innovative in how those reports are shared. Some of the filters we'll, we'll be able to customize and make it more intuitive and accessible. Another thing that the data book was published in December. If you haven't already seen it, I'll drop the link to our data page, which has our monthly governor's reports, our data book when it's published yearly, and any other important um, documents and reports. Another thing that's coming down the line is our child and family service review. We, if you're familiar, we have a group from the Office of um, program integrity, and they go through cases across the state to ensure that we're having good case practice, that we're um, following the requirements that we have as we're being checked by the feds. So for round four, which is a larger evaluation of, a, of um, assessments that are happening, this is happening across all child welfare jurisdictions, and it's not just within Oregon. We'll be starting ours soon. That means you'll have the opportunity to um, participate in focus groups in the spring and summertime and again later this fall in certain areas whether it's permanency or resource families or service array or any other topics that pertain to child welfare case practice. Really want robust feedback from you all to help us identify our current state and that will help build our program improvement plan in the future. So more information will be forthcoming to, I will share those details and logistics but just keep tabs on our newsletter which I will drop in the chat for community engagement. You can subscribe. We'll have information shared there. It will be on our website. We'll tweet it. We'll send it out on LinkedIn. We'll have all the different places and spaces because we truly want to hear the voice of you all. Thanks so much. And I'll pass it back to Tim. All right. Those are the topics that we had for you today. Uh, we're going to jump into our Q&A session here. Uh, so I think the first question is for April. Are there any new strategies being explored to help recruit foster homes given the continued loss of homes all over Oregon. We struggle to place any child over age one despite few special needs. This is true across the state. Would you like to take this, April? I'm happy to take it. I think, you know, it's really, and I, you know, I have to say, um, we have a whole team of retention and recruitment champions that are working closely with individual districts to, you know, come up with innovative, you know, creative recruitment strategies to partner with you all out there in the districts to make sure that folks have what they need because each community might have some, you know, different audiences and folks that they're recruiting from and places. Uh, what I want, and there was another question in the Q and A, and I just want to, I want to, I want to let you all know why we don't talk about there being a foster care crisis. We have a ton, a ton of resource homes. We have a ton of families that come forward um, in partnership um, with our partners and our providers who are doing solid recruitment efforts. We are not at a loss of resource homes. I think where we have a lot um, of work that we can continue to do is to make sure that the process of streamlining, continuing to streamline our certification process, making sure that people have access to our revamped um, training and development um, and making sure um, that our placement matching processes are meeting national best practices. Like we continue to see opportunities for us to improve um, as we look to make sure that every child in our state um, has a place to go and that people feel confident in their skill set that they're able to do that. But I do not hear on the regular that we are struggling to place babies. I don't. Um, and so it's, you know, it's really interesting to me and a question that I'm going to be taking back to our champion um, team and recruitment team, because that would be absolute news to me. I hear every day that we've got people who are willing to help. Um, and so really figuring out what those barriers are, because clearly if it's coming up, then it is a barrier um, that we may need to address it, some additional barriers that aren't about the number of homes we have, um, but it could be some other aspects of our um, placement process that need to be looked at. But I appreciate the question. All right, um, continuing on, we got a couple questions in the Q&A that we wanna to touch on. 
Um, I think Lacey's going to take this next one. Lacey, are there discussions underway about increasing flexible funding for family coaches to use to meet immediate needs for the family they are working with? Yes, and it's a great question. One of the good learnings, the benefits that we learned out of um, going through a global pandemic as a country is we had a lot of access to emergency funding from the federal government that we were able to give to families in terms of direct and concrete support. And that's a global we. A lot of different state agencies got um, access to those kind of funds. Really smart folks have been researching that and have started to prove some national evidence that when you give families the concrete support that, you, that they need, they do better, they stay better, their children do better, and their children don't expu uh, uh, um, experience child abuse. So we are in active conversation about anti-poverty effort in, in co collaboration with our self-sufficiency partners, as well as other people and organizations, both in Oregon and nationally. We're gonna have big things to talk about with you all coming up soon, um, but we are working on, um, to answer the, the, the core of the question, we're working on building our ask to our ODHS director collectively of what our 25-27 budget is going to look like. And I don't want to spell anything for self-sufficiency, but we're really looking about the partnership and also where we can have um, concrete funding and support as well. Once it's gone through the approval process through um, the ODHS director and then of course our governor, we'll be able to talk about what the state's requested budget's going to be and where within that we'll see flex flexibility for concrete supports for families. I, I was wondering if how Lacey was going to handle that question because we do have big news to share with you and we're it's not really a secret but there is a whole comm strategy around it um that we're really excited about we've been sitting on it for a little bit um but we are gonna we're gonna we're gonna do right by our our, our comms team and not let the cat out of the bag before February so stay tuned for some exciting news um in February that also helps to answer that question about fun, uh, flexible funds to support um, families in need. Okay, looking at the clock, I'm guessing we've got time for one more here. Um, so April, I think this one's for you. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna summarize here the question. It, it really, it's about a consistent rate of change in caseworkers for kids. What's being done to recruit and retain quality caseworkers? I am happy to answer that question, but I actually am going to look at the question directly. So a couple of things that I'll highlight. We created, and I'm going to look to Lacey and Alicia to, to keep me honest here, but um, I think in 2021, we launched our statewide caseload ratio standard. Um, and so what we did is we looked at, and I've worked in places that um, uh, in other states that, you know, we were asking these questions about what's an appropriate workload, what's an appropriate caseload, and there's lots of conversations about that that happen nationally. Um, there has been no set workload model for child welfare nationally, but people do have caseload expectations and standards. And so the Council on Accreditation, as well as Child Welfare League of America and others who have been involved in child welfare for quite some time, informed um, uh, our development of our caseload standard, uh, which really says that we have, you know, one um, CPS safety caseworker for every uh, seven assessments that are assigned a month. And we have one permanency caseworker for every 12, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I gotta look it up, I think it's 12. And then for our certification staff, it's one staff for 21 um, licensed homes. So that standard, um, that we are holding ourselves to is the best practice standard, right? Like that is that is that is some of the lowest in the nation in terms of a caseload um, standard. So we actually are doing very well. We are maintaining our caseload standard um, um, per uh, the 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 caseload standard that we put out. We are currently in compliance with that caseload standard. We went forward to them to the legislature last year. Um, in long session that just ended in June to ask for additional safety positions because we know that although our safety caseworkers, they may have an average of seven uh, assessments per month um, in the state right now. But we also know that a brand new caseworker, I remember being a brand new caseworker 
um, way back in the dinosaur ages, but I do remember what it was like to be a brand new caseworker. You, you need time to learn how to do your job. And what many of the experts have talked about is that it takes you two years just to learn how to do one role. So if you are only a year in, you know, the, the, the level of expertise and quality and proficiency continues to grow the longer you do the job, right? So really being able to ask for additional staff so that we can give new workers an opportunity to learn how to do the job so that they don't have to be at seven every month, right? So that was one of the pieces of, of investment um, that we really wanna create a buffer within our workforce. And so we were really grateful to members of the legislature um, who have pa passed that funding for um, uh, to, to use our caseload standard um, to um, ask for additional positions from the, red, from the legislature. Second, um, I think many of you know that prior to taking this job as a child welfare director, I was really brought into the state to help transform the training system because that's really where a lot of my expertise comes from and my experience comes from is, is helping other states transform their training system. So first thing I came in and did and it came in and said was, we need to do an assessment of our training system. It yielded, you know, some reports that are out there that showed that we needed to we need to create the infrastructure to have a workforce development system, not a training system. And a workforce development system really functions on uh, it, it focuses on way more than just training. It, first, it focuses on retention. It focuses on recruitment. It focuses on university partnerships. It focuses on creating pathways for meaningful career development into human services. So we really need to look at all of the things that happen before a person takes a job, all of the things that happen after a person takes a job so that they can grow competency and confidence. Um, and then we need to make sure that they are coached and skilled up to be excellent at their job. We didn't have any of that infrastructure, but the legislature again um, in the 2020, 21, 1921-21 um, uh, uh, long session, legislative session gave us positions to create that workforce infrastructure. So we're really looking forward to in 2024, you all beginning to continue to see uh, the implementation of a workforce development framework for child welfare that really, really hope grows the diversity, the competence, the confidence of our workforce, in addition to maintaining our caseload standards. That really is the formula for success around managing a workforce um, is that we, we have a standard, we operate off that standard that we put supports in place to make sure that we can we have our sta our staff um, confident and competent, and that we're using our data to understand how well we're doing. And so, really looking at um, positions that we put in place to help us evaluate is April's theory of change really working? So we're excited about this year because that team is now finally hired um, and starting to turn on. Okay, well. It never ceases to surprise me how quickly the time that we allot for this flies by, but we are there. Uh, April, any, any final words to close us out? You know, I really hope that, I'm really glad that you all come to these. I think one of the things that we've been learning, you know, we started these in the middle of the pandemic. And although I wish we could have these in person with all of you, it does give us a little bit more reach um, to bring you all um, important information. But we also wanna use our CQI framework to improve these. Right, and so we're wondering if you could spend the next three minutes or so in the chat, if there are topics you all want us to come and talk about, if there are presentations that you all want us to bring, I really appreciate Mary and Kristen coming and talking about this work. They are the experts in this work um, for DHS and I rely on their, um, their, their leadership and their skill um, as I rely on so many people. It is all not me, it is certainly the people that are working here every day um, that are bringing the best information and so, we wanna be transparent. And I think that transparency means we bring more people um, to this space um, that can represent the good work. So if there are things you want us to talk about, if you want us to do less talking at you and more question and answer, if you want us to have more of these more frequently, we are really open to your suggestions, topics that you're interested in hearing about, those kinds of things. Um, but we just appreciate you all taking time out of your busy day, um, serving kids and families to spend time with us. Um, and just appreciation. Stay warm. We hope that you all are safe. We will keep this open for a few moments if you've got things that you want to throw in the chat or topics that you want us to bring onto the conversation. Thank you. And, and just a reminder, the chat's not open, but you can put stuff in the Q&A.
me. No this worries. Why, Thanks, this April. Is why I need, this is why I need tech people. So if you just throw it in the Q&A, that'd be helpful. Thanks for that reminder. <laughs> Appreciate it, April. Thank you all for being here. And uh, we'll see you at the next one of these. Have a great evening. Thank you. Stay warm. <laughs>